everybody listened to the summary of the judgment which I delivered in complete silence, apart from when I said, this is the unanimous decision of us all, and there was an audible gasp. We were all brought up to believe in the sovereignty of Parliament as the fundamental principle of our constitution, not the sovereignty of the Prime Minister, not the sovereignty of the government, the sovereignty of Parliament. You overruled the Lord Chief Justice. So did those judges in the High Court get it wrong? Well, of course they got it wrong. It is a public service, which is one of the first duties of a government, to have a justice system that functions. Do our politicians realise that? I think they probably don't. This is The Judges, Power, Politics and the People, hosted by the University of Law. This week, I'm speaking with Lady Hale of Richmond. Brenda Hale is perhaps the judge best known to the general public. She's the first woman to become president of the UK Supreme Court. In 2019, she led the court in its most politically sensitive case to date, whether Boris Johnson's government had acted unlawfully in proroguing Parliament. All 11 justices declared that it had, and Lady Hale became the focus of worldwide media attention. She acquired the nickname Spider Woman, a reference to the brooch she wore when she gave judgment. Hale has since used it as the title of her recent autobiography. Brenda Hale came to the High Court bench after a career as an academic and at the Law Commission. In 2004, she became the first woman to be appointed to the House of Lords. She grew up in Richmond, Yorkshire, one of three sisters. Both parents became head teachers, and all three sisters were head girl at Richmond High School for Girls. Hale was the first from her school to attend Cambridge, reading law at Girton College, and was one of only six women studying law amongst 110 men. I began by asking Lady Hale what it had been like being a woman in a male judicial world. Well, it was a bit lonely. Uh, and I felt a great responsibility uh, if I was the first not to be the last. And this was very difficult because yes. it took a long time you know, for other women to come through the system. We've done quite well in the High Court and Court of Appeal now. Yes, it's got better. It's, got, time... it's got a lot better because it's now about a third, which mm. is pretty good. Uh, but it took 13 years to get another woman in the top court in the United Kingdom. We then managed to get up to three and now we're back down to one. So this is unfortunate. Why has it been so slow? Well, of course, you have to have suitable people. You can't appoint people just because they are women or just because they come from other uh, relatively underrepresented groups. You've got to have people who are going to do a good job. Um, and so recognising those can be a problem. I think women have struggled to have their merits recognised. Certainly when I was younger, they, they did. Now I think everybody knows that we all bring uh, our own skills and experiences into the business of judging, and that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Well, when you started out, as you say, I remember on one occasion, you, you, you described how it felt as sticking out like a sore thumb. Mm. And mm. Well, that was the case, was it, for quite a while? Well, yes, I don't want to make too much of it, because on the whole, my colleagues were really friendly and welcoming and seemed to find me OK to get along with. Uh, maybe they didn't behind the scenes, but they seemed to be. So it's only that I visibly stuck out like a sore thumb. If you look at the photos, which we had taken every year of the Law Lords, so for the five and a half years I was there, I was very visibly a, a woman. I did, I did take steps to make it clear that I was visible. You know, I, di I didn't just try and dress Hide as away. much like a man as possible. Uh, I thought, no, I'll dress like the other members of the House of Lords do. Exactly. And, and your, you say the colleagues were, your colleagues were friendly and on the whole kind of welcoming, mm. but um, I think it was Lord Hope. He, he was a little less uh, uh, friendly, wasn't he? I mean, he certainly wasn't. He wrote his, his own well, biography. Well, he was entirely friendly uh, to my face. I don't think any of us knew that he was writing <laughs> uh, uh, 
diaries that uh, detailed his daily life. And uh, I certainly didn't know uh, that he'd written an entry when I was about to join the House of Lords uh, saying that Brenda will be a source of some anxiety until we have got used to the very different contribution she will make. I was thinking to myself, why, why should they be anxious about having a woman or me? Um, and why should they think that my contribution will be different? After all, we're there as law lords. You know, we're there to do judging. But I think we'll come to your contribution, but I think it probably was different, wasn't it? I don't think that's for me to say. I think that's for objective outsiders to say whether I did things a little bit differently or made decisions that others didn't. I mean, I can think of some examples, um, but as a general proposition, I don't know what history will um, decide. <laughs> Yes, they were undoubtedly nervous. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the second reason that you became a household name, and more than that, as a global name, really, was the key ruling, and I think you've described it as your most important ruling, was the prorogation decision, ruling the government as having acted illegally, unlawfully. How did that feel when you became such a focus of attention not just you, but what you wore and famously your spider brooch. Mm. <laughs> Tell me about that. Well, the, the whole spider brooch thing was um, a surprise because I have been wearing brooches on my, uh, the garments I wear in court uh, ever since the family division. My husband started giving me brooches just to cheer things up a bit, a bit of individuality. So it never occurred to me that there would be such a focus on the particular brooch that I was wearing. And if I had thought that people would read things into it, I would have chosen something. I'd probably have chosen a dragonfly, which I'm <laughs> now wearing, which I think would be much more difficult to uh, read things into than a spider was. And I certainly, had I known that The Who had a song called Boris the Spider, Oh, yes. Which I did not know at all. Had I known that, I certainly would not have worn a spider. And did you choose the spider that morning deliberately, with some thought in mind? As no, to... not at all. No, not you at just... all. It was, I chose the dress it... deliberately. Yeah. You know, nice, demure, little black crepe number. Yes. Uh, and that dress has a spider on it. Simple as that? As Absolutely as simple as that. Most of my brooches uh, find their way to the garment where they feel most at home, and that's where they stay. And when you came in to deliver judgment that morning, and we'll come back to the actual mm. decision in a minute, when you came in to deliver that judgment, it must have been a bit of a nerve-wracking moment, was it? Yes, it probably was. I don't recall feeling any more nervous than I normally would going in to deliver judgment in other cases. We were very, of course, aware that the courtroom was full and the whole thing was being televised, didn't realise it was being televised all over the world, um, and that there was a lot of interest uh, and a certain amount of discord, if I put it no strongly. The uh, court security people were much more visible than they normally are in the courtroom, and the staff had decided that my husband had better sit upstairs in the gallery rather than on the body of the court in case he was recognised and people started uh, I don't know, berating him or whatever. Or attacking Not, him or yes. something. All of this was completely unnecessary. Everybody was extremely well behaved, of course, as people are. And uh, everybody listened to the summary of the judgment, which I delivered in complete silence, apart from when I said, this is the unanimous decision of us all. And there was an audible gap, gasp then. Um, but otherwise, it was a very civilised occasion. I, I think that was a, a, a surprise, wasn't it? I think as a, an outsider to people that it was unanimous because there were a lot of you. Eleven, wasn't it? Yes, there were, there were the I, maximum number of serving yes. judges that we could have sitting. Well, yes. were you surprised that you, you achieved unanimity on well, it? Well, I'm not sure that I achieved unanimity. We achieved unanimity. You did, but you yes. were chairing the... I was chairing it the and committee. I did my best uh, to enable us to reach conclusions quickly, yes. which was the really important thing, because there would have been no point in our hearing the case if we'd let the whole five weeks of the prorogation 
uh, go if we were going to agree with the Scots, which we did. Did you have to put any pressure on your colleagues to come into line and say, look, we really want to get a unanimous ruling on no, this? No, I didn't. No. I think everybody was working together. We all wanted to get the right result. Um, and there were four questions. One was, is this justiciable at all? Because the English High Court had said, no, it isn't. But the Scottish Court of Session had said, yes, it is. So that was number one question. Number two question was, is if it's justiciable, what are the principles? Uh, and that, of course, was the thing that took fine tuning to work out what the principles exactly were. Third question was, how do those principles apply to these facts? That wasn't too difficult once we'd worked out what the principles were. And the thing that had been really neglected in the arguments in front of us was, what's the consequence? If we agree with the Scots that the advice to Her Majesty was unlawful, is the consequence that which the Scots had said it was, which was that Parliament had not been prorogued. The whole thing was invalid and of no effect. And we'd had remarkably little argument about that until we actually asked for it on the last day. Some people won't understand and were critical, I think. I mean, you overruled the, the Lord Chief Justice. So did those judges in the High Court get it wrong? Well, of course they got it wrong. Um, but that's the purpose of having an appeal. You know, they got it wrong to the extent of saying this is not something that we can consider the legality of. But if we had not been overruling the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, we would have been overruling the Lord President of the Court of Session in Scotland, who is a person of equal stature. So just because there are fewer people in Scotland than there are in England and Wales, don't think that their justice system is any less important than um, the England and Wales one is. One of the things that being in the Supreme Court teaches you is that we are a United Kingdom and there are three separate jurisdictions in that United Kingdom and they all are equally worthy of respect and being taken seriously. It's another reason why we had to take the case whether we liked it or not. Because the English court had decided that Parliament had been prorogued and the Scottish court had decided that Parliament hadn't been prorogued. They couldn't both be right. There's only one Parliament. Indeed. I mean, you, it, it, it was regarded as quite a political decision, but I imagine you would say it had nothing to do with people's views on Brexit or anything uh, political uh, involved in it. I mean, but, but judges' politics didn't come into it, would you absolutely say? Absolutely, judges' politics didn't come into it. I can quite honestly say that with, I think, two exceptions, I don't know the politics of the colleagues that I had in the House of Lords or the Supreme Court. I can make a guess, uh, but lots of us are what one might call swing voters or uh, people who are not going to subscribe to the manifesto of any one political party. But will, and it certainly doesn't affect our judgment on constitutional matters. And in your time as sitting as a judge, which was a quite a lengthy period, taking mm. account of right through the High Court, right up to the Supreme Court, did, do, do you think judges actually can leave their politics at the door of the court, or is that an unrealistic expectation? Well, I jolly well hope that we can. Um, and as I say, I think a lot of judges, they're so used to listening to both sides of any argument. It's very difficult to... You may have a sort of underlying philosophy which is pro a particular economic um, view of the world, because that's how politics have traditionally been divided. You may do, but I don't think that that comes into it. Uh, and uh, it, it's really quite difficult these days, I think, to identify political reasons why people are doing things. But in any case, you've got to try and ignore all that. Let's talk a bit about your background. I mean, you reached this absolutely senior position at the apex of the judiciary, a position of great power. Uh, did you ever imagine when you were a schoolgirl in Richmond that, that, would, that this is where you would end up? Absolutely and did not. You, did you hope, did you have ambitions to get up, get to the top of the judiciary? No, not at all. I had ambitions. I, I think I've taken everything one ambition at a time. 
So when I was at school, my ambition was to get to Oxford or Cambridge or another university if that didn't happen. And that was quite a large ambition because in my age group, as we were reminding ourselves only this weekend, only two and a half percent of the girls aged 18 to 21 went to university. It's only about five percent of the boys, but you know, half the number of girls as, as boys. So it was quite an ambition to have, but it was a realistic ambition. And when I got to Cambridge, the ambition was to do well enough in my degree in Cambridge to get somewhere interesting in the legal profession and, and so on and so forth. It just went you know, from one step to the other. The first woman High Court judge was appointed while I was an undergraduate in Cambridge, 1965. She was appointed the first uh, county court judge in 62 and she was promoted to the High Court in 65. Uh, she wasn't joined by another woman until Rose Halborn joined her in 1974. So it would have been a very unrealistic ambition, <laughs> <laughs> even supposing that one thought one had the skills, the attributes, the luck. Yes. And there's an awful lot of luck in any career. Yes. Um, so you went step by step and you yeah. came from quite an academic background in the sense that yes. both your parents were teachers. And I, I imagine it was quite... Um, uh, a hard-working kind of serious background, was it? I mean, you've described yourself, you've called yourself a girly swat. A specky swat. And a specky swat specky in the book. Specky yes, yes. Both. Oh, I well, think. I was undoubtedly a specky swat. I did work hard at school, and I was actually being reminded, as I say, this weekend, which I spent with um, fellow alumni in Girton, um, that I was regarded as quite a swat when I was in uh, Cambridge. I didn't regard myself as a swat when I was in Cambridge because I had an awfully <laughs> good time as well. I did an awful lot of other things apart from working. Um, but yes, I've probably always been a bit of a swat. Well, and when you used that phrase, just, just on that phrase, the girly swat, you used it much later in a speech. Were you having a go at Boris Johnson? Because he'd had a go at David Cameron, hadn't he? Well, Described, describing him in those terms. It, it was a matter of regret. I was giving a little welcome to the uh, Association of Heads of Girls State Schools, uh, of which I'm patron. And, I was, and it was very shortly after the judgment. And they had actually put up a banner, uh, which involved Boris Johnson and so on, which, which was unfortunate. And, and then I said, as you would say, to the Association of Heads of Girls State Schools, let's uh, hear it, hear it for the girly swats, because we all believe in the girly swats. And of course, yes, it was a bit of a dig, because <laughs> the one thing we did know about the run up to the prorogation, we knew very little about it. But the one thing we did know was that he had scribbled on a memo proposing this prorogation that, well, we only sat in September anyway, because that girly swap Cameron wanted to <laughs> prove that we were earning our crust or something like that. So yes, it was a bit of a dig, but I was sorry that it was in front of a banner um, because otherwise it was a perfectly respectable thing to be saying to the particular audience to which I was saying it. You have explained in your book, Spider Woman, but perhaps you could tell us how you came to choose law. I think you said it arose out of a love of history. History was my favourite subject at school, and I thought it was my best subject at school. Our headmistress was an Oxford history graduate. She did, I think, think that I was clever enough to get to Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, but we had a conversation quite early on in my A-level career, I think, where she said, um, Yes, Brenda, but I don't think you're a natural historian. Is there something else that we could think of? Uh, Why did she say that? I don't know. I don't know, because when I got to, to Girton, the uh, Director of Studies in History said, we'd have been thrilled to have you reading history. But by that stage, of course, I had committed myself to the idea of law. My headmistress said, well, what about economics? And I wasn't at all attracted by economics, uh, partly because of the economic theory we'd had to study as part of our history course, and I knew I wasn't a theoretician. But I'd also been fascinated by constitutional history, um, in the in the political uh, history uh, part of the syllabus. So I said, what about law? 
And it's really to her credit that she didn't say nonsense. Girls don't do law, or they only do law if their fathers are solicitors, which is by and large true. We're talking 1960 on here. Um, she said, that's, that's fine. There's nothing we can positively do to help you, but of course, we're not going to hinder you. No. And, and it turned out, of course, that it was exactly the right thing. And of course, you had a, a very unusual career for a judge in mm. that you came in, mm. as is well known, through the academic route mm. and, and then went to the Law Commission. And from there, you then became a judge. Did you feel that people were a little bit resentful of your coming in from that background? Did they think you weren't really a proper judge when you first became a judge? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably, but of course they were far too polite to say so. <laughs> so I think some people found it refreshing that I didn't have some of the background um, knowledge and experience that... Uh, many of my colleagues had. So, for example, when barristers were appearing in front of me, I was not impressed by which chambers they came from. You know, I, did, I haven't built in this, you know, we have to respect the barristers who are in these particular top sets of quite, chambers, quite. which I'm not going to name. Um, <laughs> and I could just look at the quality of the job they were doing. And I think probably the other thing was that I didn't come with built-in assumptions about what the right answer was. You know, I genuinely wanted to hear both sides of the argument and work out what the answer was. And you found yourself, because of that, perhaps dissenting, would you say, more than people did? Or? No, I wasn't. I'm not the top dissenter by You're any means. You're not the top dissenter, no. but you did dissent on a, a, a few key rulings. I, I dissented on a few, as you say, key rulings. Um, where I thought that people had taken insufficient account. In fact, the major dissents were all, all about women, I think. Would you, and let's, let's take one as an example then, pick out one that you think was an interesting one that you really, were you sure you were right? And, and then they ruled otherwise, obviously, you were in the minority. What one would you think of? Well, a very early case in the House of Lords, where a man in, I think, his 30s, who was employing a schoolgirl at weekends, you know, in a weekend Saturday job, uh, groomed her and had sex with her many times between the ages of 13 and 15, so unlawfully, what we would now call statutory rape, but we then called unlawful sexual intercourse. She didn't complain until she was 17. The, the, the law then had a limitation period that proceedings, prosecutions for unlawful sexual intercourse could not be brought more than 12 months after the event. So that was out of time. But of course, unlawful sexual intercourse also involves um, unlawful assault, sexual assault. Um, and so indecent assault, as it was then called. Uh, and so he was prosecuted for that. And he never denied it. He said he'd done it. Well, at least by the time it got to the House of Lords, he wasn't denying it. But it was argued that it was an abusive process to prosecute him for what undoubtedly was a crime that he had committed because it was also another crime which the limitation period had elapsed. I see. So my four male brethren said, yes, that was an abusive process. And I said, no, the, <laughs> the only victim in this is the girl. There's absolutely no injustice. I mean, sometimes time limits are there to uh, ensure there's been a fair trial. But because he was admitting it, there was absolutely no injustice. Uh, and uh, he had undoubtedly been guilty of these offences. And why could he not be prosecuted for them? It's a good example mm. of your women woman's perspective which yes. they hadn't really t taken yeah. in your view i imagine taken adequate account of and some of the experience of being in the family division where of course we dealt with a lot of um, sexual abuse allegations and understood grooming and understood the reluctance of victims to report until very much later until they felt safe or until something happened which said well we everybody now understands that but I'm talking, I suppose, 2004, something mm. like that. It These was, are the qualities yeah. that you brought to the job, which 
had been lacking perhaps before you arrived on the scene, would you say? Well, this well I, I don't want to be critical, but I think I did bring a, a perspective which maybe had been not quite there. But then sometimes, of course, there's, there's, there's not a problem because when we had a case about whether female genital mutilation Everybody agreed it was persecution, but whether it was because of your membership of a particular social group so as to qualify for refugee status, uh, by the time it got to the House of Lords, everybody agreed that it was because of your membership of a particular social group, namely women. <laughs> or in my case, I said women belonging to a tribe which practiced female genital mutilation, which I think is a completely coherent uh, mm -hmm. concept rather than just all women but um, but so so I wouldn't accuse my colleagues of not from time to time getting oh. the point but you obviously whether descending or not you you had a big impact and were able to bring um, power to bear in a different way what do you think your main impact was I spend a lot of time these days uh, with university students or recent graduates or whatever, young lawyers. Um, and what they mainly say to me, somewhat to my surprise, is that they like reading my judgments. And I think part of that is that they are attuned to the sort of perspective from which the judgments come. Part of it is that they're quite short on the whole. Comparatively speaking, they're not short, but they're com And partly it is that they are clear. Accessible language. Accessible language. And I put that down to all my years of teaching university students. So no wonder I can write in a style that university students find accessible. And if you were to pick a particular ruling, apart from the one we've mentioned, prorogation, of which you're proud, most proud maybe, which would it be? Well, there are quite a lot. I think the one that, well, there are there are two uh, which came almost at the same time, but one of them was a ruling about the meaning of the word violence. Because there was a tendency, in fact, the courts had held that violence was limited to hitting or threatening to hit. Whereas women, and indeed everybody, realises the word violent can be used to describe all sorts of behaviour which doesn't involve hitting or being hit, but induces fear and uh, and is an aspect of control. Psychological yes. violence or yes. coercive control? Well, basically we now call it coercive control because we've worked out a word for it, but that judgment was recognising what we now call coercive control as violence. It happened to be in the context of homelessness and housing the homeless and whether a woman was intentionally homeless because she has she had fled with her children from coercive control, as we would now call it. Um, we held that, yes, the word violence in the relevant legislation was capable of including more than just hitting and threatening to hit. Now, that's quite a female perspective because, of course, women are controlled in many more ways than just by physical violence, whereas on the whole, men are controlled by physical violence. I, that's a generalisation. It's obviously not universally true, but that's what men are afraid of, whereas women are afraid of many more sorts of controlling behaviour. And that was a unanimous decision of all five, so I was really quite proud of that. Do you, do you think you swung your colleagues round to that view? No, I think the arguments swung them round. Um, your arguments? No, the arguments... Of, oh, that were put to you? Yes, I mean, mostly, counsel. you know, judges listen to what they're being told by barristers and so on. And that was a case in which and it's not unusual, the government intervened on the side of the woman against the local authority that was saying that you no know, violence is limited to, um, to hitting. Um, because the government's policy was that violence covered a wider range of behaviours. And so the, gov and the government came along with a huge amount of really useful information you know, we look at the background, we look at what led to the legislation, we look to how the word was understood when the legislation was passed, but we also look to, because so many words in legislation are capable of 
developing their meaning over time. So we looked at how the word had developed over time. Um, um, yes. No, it wasn't, it wasn't just me making it up. It never is. It never is. <laughs> <laughs> what about regrets? Any judgments you look back on and think, actually, I, I think that was wrong in hindsight? That's an awfully difficult question. I'm sure there will be judgments that, that uh, were wrong, probably more at first instance than on appeal, because when you're on appeal, you're never alone. And so occasionally you're dissenting, but not very frequently. Um, and if I think of the dissents I can remember, I think on the whole, I don't regret them. Uh, sometimes regret the language in which they were couched. I realise that sometimes I could be quite forceful. <laughs> but I didn't think I was being at the time. Being surrounded you by all probably, these forceful people. I was, you know? I, I, that's exactly what I was going to say. You had to be. Yes. You had to make your voice heard. I, I think so. I think that's right. Uh, but I'm sure there will be cases uh, at first instance where yes. I didn't get it right. Yes. Uh, and one of the unfortunate things about sitting at first instance is that you don't necessarily have the feedback as to how things went after you have made this momentous decision about who's done what to whom and what the consequences are. So there is one dissent which really upset my colleagues. And so I regret having upset them. Because they wanted unanimity or because no, they no, didn't no, like people you? Are not, people on the whole are pretty relaxed about um, dissent in, in the House of Lords and Supreme Court. Um, so why were they upset? They were upset. It was a case about whether it was open to a local authority in uh, meeting the needs of a woman who needed help to get up to go to the loo in the, in the night. night. I remember it, yeah. yes. Uh, but wasn't incontinent. And the local authority decided that they would supply her with incontinence pads. And I said, that's irrational. The need is X and you are meeting that need by supplying something that isn't needed to meet that need. Um, and, uh, but the others didn't agree with me. Um, and I did point out... You thought she needed help being got yes, to the loo. of course. That yes. was what she needed. Yes. Now, admittedly, that's, of course, much more expensive and so on and so forth. But I did point out the implications of their having said, pads are all right, because I said that means, you know, pads could be supplied to anybody uh, day or night, and whether the problem was uh, urine or faeces. So I mentioned that terrible word defecation. So is this what upset them? I think that so. You had I used really such vocabulary. I really do think that that's what upset them. <laughs> and afterwards, uh, a, another senior woman judge uh, came up to me and said, oh, this is obviously a, a man-woman thing, which hadn't occurred to me about it. She said, because men can always pee in a bottle. So they don't realise the difficulties that women have, yes. um, or at least they haven't addressed their minds to them. No. Whereas women's difficulties in that respect, as we know, are, are different. different. Anyway, so I thought that was quite interesting. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> when, they, when you say they were upset, I mean, did they, did they kind of uh, remonstrate with you subsequently or even No, the only in their judgments, actually. Um, somebody used the word, I deplore. Oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> did you find that a bit upsetting? Or did it just surprising. Surprising. harden, you, harden well, you in your resolve well, that you'd done the right thing? I, yes, it probably did harden me in my resolve, <laughs> especially after the comment from my female colleague you know, a, a little while later. Yes. Um, and there's room for disagreement about whether I was right about the irrationality. That's, that's, but it was rather an astonishing reaction, wasn't it? Yes, it was rather strange. But... Uh, it didn't mean that we fell out. We didn't fall out. Uh, the very next judgment um, was a joint judgment with the chap who'd been presiding in the case you know, where I used this terrible word. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we got on perfectly well and were able to write a judgment together. So I don't think it had lasting impact. No, and, and finally, it's not quite related, but on the whole issue of clubbableness, if there is such a word, and you had spoken out often about uh, 
how your male colleagues could all get together at the Garrick and, and have their chats over dinner and so on. And you were excluded, obviously, from the Garrick, not allowing women. Did you feel very much an outsider? Well, I think there's been an element of being an outsider throughout my life. But I don't think it, I let it bother me or whatever. I think we just got, got on with it. Um, I mean, we were a bit of outsiders in the village I grew up in, in North Yorkshire, because we were teachers and there were just, most of the locals were uh, uh, on the land one sort or another with a very strict social hierarchy. And so the, the vicar, the teachers, the uh, doctor were kind of incoming professionals. So we were a bit outside yes. the social structure. Of course, as women in Cambridge, women students in Cambridge, we were outsiders because there were only three women's colleges and 21 men's colleges. Less of an outsider in Manchester, which has always regarded itself as a go Which ahead. is where you went first. That's where I went after. And did your academic yes, that's career. Right. And where I joined the Manchester Bar. Um, and that was at a time when the Manchester Bar was, ex you know, allowing, it was allowing more women in. I was the second woman in the chambers that I joined, not the first. Um, and we had the great um, model of Rose Halbron, you know, huge star at the bar to encourage the women on the Northern Circuit. So less of an outsider there. Obviously, when I went to the Law Commission, I was the first woman. So only one woman among five um, very, very clever um, men. Um, uh, but you know, on the whole, they were also people who listened to the argument. I mean, this is the thing about lawyers. You know, there's an argument. You listen to the argument. Yes. And that's what you do. First and as you say, obviously, yeah. then when you went onto the bench, yeah. an outsider there to the extent you were very much a minority. Uh, yeah. All the way up, yes. really. Well, that's right, um, yes. Um, but you just get on with it, don't you? You think, well, I can yes. do it. Yes. I'm sure I can. Well, the other thing I think, there have been occasions in my life where I've wondered whether I could do it, <laughs> which is what I begin Spider Woman with. Uh, but I've generally found that I could do it. But what I always say to young women when they say, well, we have imposter syndrome too, we wonder whether we can do it. I say, well, if you're being asked to do something, somebody thinks you can do it. So your job is to do it and do your best at it. And if it turns out that it's not for you, it's their fault, not yours. <laughs> and that, would you say that's a particularly female quality? I mean, Well, I, no, I'm sure lots of men have it too. I think women are... Much more ready. prone to doubt. They're much, well, they may be more prone to doubt. Uh, I mean, there's a well-known story of, you know, looking at a, the qualities required in a particular job and, a, and the 10 qualities and the woman says, I've only got five of them, so I won't apply. And the man says, I've got five of them, so I will apply. Um, I don't know how true that is. Uh, but there is an argument that women are more prone to self-doubt. But there are plenty of men who are prone to self-doubt. I think women are more prone to confess it, acknowledge it. Much more honest about it. I think. Oh, forthcoming, <laughs> shall we put that? <laughs> so I'd like to talk to you now a bit about the, the whole role of the judiciary vis-a-vis -vis the executive and parliament as a, a limb of the constitution. How much of a role do you think judges have or should have in intervening and actually changing the law? Oh, changing the law? Uh, or creating new law, how well, do you like to put it? Sometimes you've got no choice because, as you know, our laws are made either by Parliament or by the judges in the courts. And for centuries, they were almost always made by judges in the courts. And so over those centuries, a body of principle builds up and eventually somebody looks at this mass of decisions and realises that this is what the principle is or these are what the principles are. And then new situations arise and the principles have to be applied to the new situation. And that's the whole way in which the common law works. Uh, and it's happened for many, many years, centuries. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, if one made up something completely off the wall, well, maybe that wouldn't be a good idea. But as I always say, we are not making it up as we go along. We are building on the accumulated wisdom of the centuries. Um, there is 
an interesting, complicated, ongoing debate about um, the extent to which judges can um, make new law. Uh, and I think it's fairly, we all think about it, we all worry about it. Uh, it's not something that we you know, do lightly. And I think, uh, yes, we can develop new remedies. Yes, we can build on um, applying existing principles to new situations. Uh, yes, we can take into account a context which possibly the earlier decisions did not take into account. Think about it, some of the cases I've been talking about, examples of that. So yes, you can, you can slowly bring the law on. Or you can say it's not for you. It's or we can say it's not for... for there parliament. are some things which undoubtedly have to be done by Parliament. There's no doubt about that. And is that line a difficult one to draw? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's yeah. really quite complicated. Yes. Um, and I've devoted quite a lot of thought and I've written about it lots of times. Um, and uh, I think we all do. And in your position as, as, as president of the Supreme Court, it particularly fell to you to bear that line in mind with your colleagues, obviously. Well, I, think with everybody. I think, I think yes. we're all conscious of it. And some are more cautious than others. There's just no doubt about that. And Where do you put yourself on that spectrum? I think about in the middle. Hmm. Um, you know, there are some occasions where it seemed fairly obvious that the law ought to modernise itself. And it's been a de de delicate political balance, hasn't it, with the creation of the Supreme Court? And a lot of people said at the time, this is going to lead to judges being far more prominent, far more political and far more interventionist. And completely wrong. Right. Yeah. I mean, that really is completely wrong. Uh, people said it. Well, yeah, people said it, but that was because they misunderstood what the nature of the uh, beast was. They were thinking of the American well, courts, maybe. Well, they were thinking, not only the American court, Supreme Court. And others. Supreme Courts throughout the Anglo-American legal world, where there is a written constitution, have the power to strike down acts of the um, federal parliament as well as of sub subordinate parliaments. Um, we have never had that power. Do you think you should? Of course not. I mean, it's not something that we're looking for. Uh, setting up the Supreme Court was there for the purpose of constitutional propriety and clarity uh, and to give us better facilities than we had in the House of Lords, uh, which meant that we were much more transparent because you know, our proceedings were broadcast, uh, live streamed, sometimes broadcast, but usually live streamed. Uh, much easier to get into the building to see what we were about. Much more opportunities for outreach to schools and universities and anybody. You know. It's really easy to walk in off the street to look around the Supreme Court, pop into a courtroom and see what's going on, see how boring our proceedings are for most people and so on and so forth. It gave the judiciary a much more public face. It, it did give us a much more public face. And that was a good thing. And I think uh, everybody thinks it's a good thing. Um, it didn't change the role. The role was the same. So you don't think that the Supreme Court enhanced or gave you a more powerful position no, of within the Constitution? No, of course not. It was exactly the position that we'd had sitting in Committee Room 1 in the House of Lords. It's just that sitting in Committee Room 1 in the House of Lords, we were rather less apparent. <laughs> but we were doing exactly the same job. Some of the biggest um, developments in the relationship between the judiciary and the executive happened in the 1960s. Not, I mean, not in the Supreme Court. And what are you thinking of in particular? Anis Minnick, um, the, uh, the case whose name I always forget about reviewing the exercise of discretion so that it's within the purposes of the statute. The point about judicial review of administrative action has always been, we're not interested in the merits of what you've done. We are interested in legal the legality of what you've done and the way you've done it. Yes. That's always been. Now, this is... And you don't have to look at the merits to reach that decision? Of course not. Right. Of course not. And of course... But mind you, it is always being challenged because somebody doesn't like the merits. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, let's not be too yes. starry-eyed about it. But the court is looking at the legality of what's been yes. done. That role has not it's changed. It's not changed. And so when no. you, to come back to where we were with the prorogation ruling, I'm sure commentators at the time said this is uh, the judges and this would have been coming from people who were Brexiteers, let's say, who felt that you were 
making a political decision, blocking the government or whatever. How, how do you react to that? Well, I would say that, wouldn't I? I would say it was not a political decision. We were not in the slightest bit concerned about whether Brexit should happen or not. We were concerned with the respective roles of government and parliament in the machinery for uh, bringing Brexit about. And not to put too fine a point on it, whether it was within, within the power of the government to shut down parliament when it suited them because they didn't like what parliament was doing. Now, to, to... We were all brought up to believe in the sovereignty of parliament as the fundamental principle of our constitution, not the sovereignty of the prime minister, not the sovereignty of the government, the sovereignty of parliament. This was established in the 17th century, which yes. we mentioned earlier. And do you think, two, two aspects of that, do you think the sovereignty of parliament has become diminished somewhat in recent years? Well, the relationship between the government and parliament is such that the government can almost always get its own way. Uh, so parliament's become weaker? Well, a little. It was always, twas ever thus, in the sense that governments are chosen because they can command a majority in Parliament. But there are lots of little and subtler ways in which the government's control over Parliament has increased. I'm sorry, over the last century, you know, we're not talking recent years. The House of Lords is quite a, 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 a bulwark there, isn't well, it? Well, the House of Lords has a very important function, both in improving the legislation that comes out of the House of Commons, because the House of Lords uh, can devote more time to it, does devote more time to it, uh, but also in asking the government to think again, yes. asking, asking the House of Commons to think again, but it's usually the government they're asking to think again. So yes, it has an important role, there's no doubt about that. And, and the other aspect, I mean, do you think in recent years that there's been more of a cavalier attitude to the rule of law amongst our uh, executive? Shall we put it like that? Politicians. <laughs> A bit more flagrant disregard, perhaps? Well, we've had some prominent examples um, in recent years. Uh, we've had a government saying we are prepared to break our international legal obligations. Uh, now, that is not normally. Normally, the UK prides itself on upholding international obligations. So that's unusual. We've had from time to time ministers saying we're not going to obey court orders. Well, that also is shocking. Uh, but these are relatively isolated. Are you examples. thinking of the attitude of ministers to um, European Court of Human Rights ruling, say? No, not so much that. Uh, no, actually, domestic court. Which rulings, one? Yes. Have you got one in no, mind? No, I haven't got one in particular in mind. I've just got an example of somebody yes. saying that. Um, no, f well, for as long as that's an international obligation. Yes. Um, but you're saying domestically they will say we won't do this. It, it, there are, have been examples of mm -hmm. this. I, it's not common. No, it's it not isn't. common at all. Um, and you could add to those really stray examples, you could add the, um, the problems which the justice system is facing including the lack of access to publicly funded legal services by those who desperately need them. And you could say that that obviously has implications for the rule of law, because the whole point about the rule of law is that not only is everybody subject to the law, the governors as well as the governed, but also everybody should have access to justice, both to assert their legal entitlements and to defend uh, themselves. The rights or whatever. Uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, and obviously, if the justice system is in trouble because it has not been given yes. adequate respect by those in power, well, then that is... And do you take that view that in I the last 10 that. years? I do take that view. Starved yes. of resources to the point that's damaging public yes. confidence yes. and access to the rule of law, as you yeah. say. And I'm not alone in that. I think you will find that most of the <laughs> senior judiciary would say the same. Yes. So how, uh, really, the, the same question, I suppose, in a different way. Do you think the current run of... Well, we've had a succession of Lord Chancellors and a stroke Justice Secretaries uh, um, in recent years. Do you think they have not had the respect in terms of funding, in terms of uh, respect for rulings and following them that we, they should have had? It's, it's depended, hasn't it? Um, 
I mean, obviously there was a rush of very severe cuts to every aspect of the justice system that, that took place um, between 2010 and 2013. Subsequent uh, Secretaries of State for Justice, stroke Lord Chancellors, have, I think, recognised that there is a problem and, uh, and have tried to do something to remedy it. But it's very difficult to claw back resources when you've been uh, starved of them. I think that's, that's really hard. Did you have to have de dealings with ministers in your role as Well, president? obviously you have to have friendly relations. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you're not doing deals about cases. You know, there are people who are really surprised, ordinary people who are really surprised that if we've got a case which involves the government, which is an awful lot of cases, Somebody doesn't ring up the uh, court and say, well, we'd like you to decide it this way. That doesn't happen. Do people think that? Yes, I've heard people say they're really surprised. Um, I mean, people you'd think would know better. It just I isn't I, the case. I, I, no. If people are under this misapprehension that deals can be struck behind the doors uh, when government might ring up and if they're involved in a case and say, can, you know, can, can we settle this? If people really think that, how can that be tackled? Well, the only way to tackle the huge uh, misapprehensions and misunderstandings and lack of knowledge about the justice system is to try and get people interested in it and to try and put over what it is, what it does, how it does it and why it's important and why it matters to everybody. Because people tend to think the justice system, well, that's just dealing with naughty people, you know, and uh, we're not naughty, so it's nothing to do with us. But actually, it does things for everyone. Uh, and it's really, really important. And it is a public service, which is one of the first duties of a government to have a justice system that functions to keep us safe at home, to keep the wheels of commerce grinding round. Do our, do our politicians realise that? I think they probably don't. Uh, looking to the future and, and the challenges, you've mentioned funding. Um, what about getting in more women into the judiciary? We've, we've, we've just had appointed the first woman Lord Chief Justice. It's taken a long time, hasn't it? Well, it has. But I, um, and what do you think about that? Is that going well, to make I, a difference? Well, I'm really delighted um, uh, that uh, we have a woman Lord Chief Justice. I do think it's a really, really difficult job. President of the Supreme Court is uh, a doddle compared with being Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales because you're only responsible for your small organisation which sits as a sort of cherry at the top of you know, um, a prof profiterole of, of the justice system, whereas the justice system of England and Wales is a lot of people, a lot of courts, a lot of systems, a lot of resources, a lot of not resources. It's a really difficult job to try and both um, be top manager of the troops, um, be top administrator of the system, although obviously the courts and administration, you know, Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service does the day-to-day -day administration, but working out the relationship between the head of the judiciary and, and the court service, all of that, that's complicated. Obviously working out the relationship with government and trying to persuade government to keep the justice system going. Managing all sorts of digitisation projects, of which there are rather a lot. Managing the fact that we uh, have a crumbling estate. Indeed. Courtrooms what, what, and so on. What an enormous job. So job. all power to her that she wants to do it. I and mean, all and credit to her that she wants to do it. Will it make a difference having a woman in that job? Uh, not necessarily. No. Will yeah. it not improve the public image of the well, it might or public's do. perception of the judiciary? It, it, it might do. Um, they've think, had you, and think, now they've got another. I think people one. like you are much better qualified to judge that. I mean, we will always say that we are judges first, and our gender is just an aspect of the many things that we bring to the business of judging. I, I should have added to the burdens on the Lord Chief Justice or Lady Chief Justice uh, is. Uh, They've also got to be a really good judge because they have to take the lead in some of the most important cases. Key rulings, yeah. exactly. Key rulings, and those rulings have to command respect. So you could be the best people person, the best administrator, the best uh, digger of resources out of reluctant governments or whatever. But if you couldn't do a good judgment in an important case, you know, you wouldn't have the respect. 
looking ahead, as I say, what challenges do you think the judiciary now faces? Getting in more women must be one of them. Well, there are loads of women in the judiciary. I, I, I think that's... Is it into the higher positions then? It's yes, yes a, a, third, to... a third of the Court of Appeal and um, High Court are now women. And it's more than that, lower down the system. In the tribunal system, um, women are as prominent as men. I think there's more than half of So the... in your time, it's changed dramatically? In my time, in this century, it's changed dramatically. I think it all began at the beginning of this century. Um, now, I'm not saying that it's perfect. I'm yeah. not saying there isn't a way to go. It's obviously very unfortunate that we've now, at the moment, only got one woman in the Supreme Court when we had actually clawed our way up to a quarter. Um, that's unfortunate. So finally, did, did you think the balance of power between the judiciary, the executive, and Parliament, has it changed in your time? Do you think it's about right? Do you think judges are as powerful as they ever were or less so? How would you describe it? Again, that's something that probably outside scholars will, in due course, you know, ask themselves about um, modern times and what has changed. But as I say, I think that the balance is as it has always been. I mean, to some extent, the power of the judiciary uh, has been reduced by Brexit because that was the one circumstance in which the judges were empowered by Parliament to disregard incompatible provisions in Acts of Parliament if they didn't comply with certain types of EU law. Now that has now gone. So there is no permission which the UK Parliament has given the judiciary to ignore provisions in Acts of the UK Parliament. Um, and that is back to square one. I mean, that's back to how things always well, used to be before 1972. So that's not surprising. No. What Parliament gives, Parliament can take away. So, so that's going to be a big impact of, of, well, of uh, yes, leaving. Uh, it, yes, it, it is an impact, it, an impact. Not necessarily a bad impact, it's just an impact. Right. Um, and uh, so I think the, the relationship is as it always has been. Mm. We didn't touch on judicial appointments. Are you happy with the current system, how it works? Oh, yes. Yes, I think the current system is one of the reasons why we have uh, done better in the diversity of judicial appointments, because it has taken it away from government and put it into the hands of um, a commission. There's, there are commissions in each part of the United Kingdom, and when it's the Supreme Court, there's an ad hoc commission is convened from each part of the United Kingdom to uh, recommend the appointments to the Supreme Court. The, um, uh, in the one-off appointments, the Commission recommends one candidate, not a slate. So the government then has the choice between saying yes, no, or convince me. Um, and basically, they have always said yes. Um, and that is because these are reasoned conclusions which are put up with, you know, the reasons why we think this person is the best mm. candidate. Mm. Now, I'm not saying the system is perfect. Lots of people criticise it. Lots of people say that it still isn't producing sufficient diversity on, on the whole, on other dimensions than gender. And mm. there is undoubtedly a problem with uh, the uh, black representation in the judiciary. Not so much that the is still poor. South Asian um, heritage representation, but the proportion of people of African or African Caribbean, Caribbean. heritage, uh, that proportion has, as I understand it, when I last looked at the figures, not gone up since uh, 2014, which is, That's and it was very, very low because it was only about 1% then. Mm. And given the over-representation mm. of people of that heritage in especially the criminal justice system at the other side of it, um, Clearly, uh, it's a problem and it needs some active thought about you know, what, what, is, what is the logjam, what is causing this, what can we do to address it? Because uh, it's not as if there's a shortage of young lawyers and able lawyers with that heritage. There, isn't, there are loads of them. So, Absolutely. So, so every system has got room for improvement. Yes. Have you enjoyed your time? What's been the best bit of it? Oh, What, what have you liked most about it? I've liked everything. I, I mean... I think I've had two wonderful bits of career. One was the Law Commission, because what's not to like about 
taking the subject you care most about by the scruff of the neck and saying, what's wrong with it? And uh, that's where you had your big impact on the law relating to children. That's right, and mental and yeah, mental capacity, health. yes. So, and, and, and actually, in retrospect, divorce. And divorce. All sorts of things. Um, so what's not to like about that? Um, but equally, what's not to like about grappling with, uh, as in the House of Lords and in the Supreme Court, arguable, so difficult, points of law of general public importance. What's not to like about doing that? This podcast was brought to you by the University of Law. Subscribe now to make sure you don't miss the next episode.